Well, good morning, Island Baptist Church family, and uh, to those of you who are maybe watching online that are not a part of our part of our church. Uh, I am actually here in Hong Kong right now doing this Sunday school lesson, which is extremely exciting, uh, not just for me but for our whole family, and we have been overwhelmed with the kindness that has been shown to us by so many of you reaching out to us and welcoming us through a a WhatsApp message. Many of you have dropped things by our hotel, and uh, we are just as excited as we can be to be here and looking forward to being released from our quarantine. Uh, It has gone well so far. We're getting a lot done. We're uh, trying to be uh, make our time profitable and making sure that we don't uh, leave the hotel room because here is our bracelet. Don't scan the QR code. Uh, but this is uh, what lets them know that we're in the right place. And Lord willing, we will have another COVID test actually today. Uh, the COVID test will be dropped off. And then uh, on Monday, we are supposed to take or uh, submit that COVID test. And if that goes well, then Lord willing, by next Sunday, we will be out of quarantine. And uh, Pastor Johnson and Catherine have been a wonderful help to us. They have a lot of our luggage at their house, and they have been dropping by with goodies for us, meals for us, uh, useful things for us, um, and doing that fairly regularly. And then several of you have been doing the same. Several of you have provided meals, and then many of you have just been so kind to uh, send a short message welcoming us to Hong Kong. We are at the Novotel Hotel in, uh, in Tung Chung and uh, looking forward to actually being able to be out here very soon. Well, let's uh, get into our time this morning. Before we pray, let me just encourage you to take a look at the bulletin that Pastor has put together, that e-bulletin. And we're, Lord willing, going to be doing some more with that in the, in the Sundays to come. But on there, you'll see our hymn for today, and that is the hymn, Jesus, I Am Resting. And there's a link there that you can go. It's a YouTube link that is just a a piano playing uh, that allows you to be able to sing along with it. And I would encourage you to do that. Uh, I mentioned in the e-bulletin notes that all through scriptures, singing is a really important part of our worship time. And so I would encourage you as a family uh, to sing through that. If you're by yourself, go ahead and sing sing through that. Nobody will hear you, so it's okay. Uh, but I think that really does uh, does help our soul. Uh, music is good in that way for our soul, but it also allows us to um, to declare to our God and in this particular hymn to know that we are resting in who our Savior is and what He has done for us. And I think especially in this time that we're facing here in Hong Kong and really around the world. Uh, it's really easy to be in turmoil and to be uh, not resting. And so this hymn is a, uh, a song that, that brings our thoughts back to the way we ought to be thinking and what ought to be going on internally. So I hope you'll take time to do that. Uh, well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will uh, we'll jump into our Sunday School lesson. I'll explain to you a little bit of a unique Sunday School time that we're going to have for the next couple weeks. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you uh, on this Lord's Day that we can come and reflect and and purpose uh, to to take time to set aside, to to think of you, to uh, honor you, to worship you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us in the Sunday school time and in the worship time to follow, that we would open our hearts and, and calm our spirits and set aside distractions so that we can focus on what you want us to learn. Lord, I pray that our time here in Sunday school be profitable. Pray for Pastor Johnson as he speaks in the worship service to follow. Lord, I thank you uh, personally for allowing us to be here in Hong Kong. Thank you for all the details that had to go just right and all the work that has been done prior to us getting here. Thank you for going before us and allowing it to be really a very smooth transition so far. And I thank you for this church family. Thank you for so many who have encouraged us and Um, shown their love tangibly by doing things for us. And may you bless them for that. Uh, Bless our Sunday school time here. May it be 
uh, useful time for all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn your Bibles this morning to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And in the Sunday School notes, I mentioned that maybe uh, you would take time to read the entire psalm. We're not going to read the entire psalm. We're just going to read a little bit of it. But I want to give you a little bit of a heads up of what I'm going to do in these next couple weeks and why I'm going to do it. In these next uh, two or three weeks, uh, most likely, uh, I would like to take the time to share with you a little bit of what I like to call um, my grace story. And uh, that's not really a, a term that um, I'm throwing out there just to be cute or uh, to be unique, but really it is for each one of us that knows Jesus Christ as our Savior, it has been God's grace that has been woven through the story of our lives. And one of the things that Tiffany and I are really looking forward to doing with many of you is to have the chance to sit down with you uh, once, once COVID is over, or maybe even we can get in a group of four. I think maybe they're allowing that now and, and as a husband and wife or as individuals. And we'd like to hear God's grace story in your life, to hear how God brought you to salvation, to hear how God has led in your life for, for a couple of reasons. One, so we can rejoice with you together in what God has done in your life and God has done in our lives, but then also so that we can know you a little bit more. We, we want to get to know what God has done in your life. We want to be transparent with each other so that we can be an encouragement to each other. So what I'm going to do over the next two or three weeks is I'm going to share God's grace story in, in my life and a little bit uh, in Tiffany's life as well, and even how God has brought us together. And here's what I'm hoping will happen as we do this. Number one, I hope primarily you will be able to rejoice in God's faithfulness uh, in, in our lives. I don't want this time to be about Matt and about Tiffany and about our family, although you're going to learn about us. I want it to be a time where we can together say, praise the Lord for God's working in our lives. You know, we see this in, in the, the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, where God uses a lot of narrative, a lot of scripture to lay out a story. Th think of Genesis chapter 37. Maybe if you were with us for Wednesday night, uh, pastor referenced Genesis 37 through 50 as, as an opportunity to see Christ in the Old Testament and the deliverance of uh, the Jews out of Egypt. And in Genesis 37 through 50, we really see a story of God's grace in the life of Joseph. And uh, we know that none of us are at that level of uh, the Old Testament characters, but, but they, were, they were humans just like we are. And God has worked in our lives, clearly not in the same way, but God has worked in our lives. And I hope that through this time, your heart and thoughts will be turned to the, the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, and the grace of God in our lives. So that, that's one of the reasons I want to do this. The second reason I want to do this is so that you all can know a little bit of our background. It'll help you connect with us more. It'll help you see, oh wow, they're just, they're just normal people, just like the rest of us. And it'll give us some common ground to be able to communicate about. And so I, I hope this time will be uh, beneficial for you. I hope it'll maybe bring, even bring out some questions that, and maybe help you be able to connect with our family and say, oh, you know what? That's, an, that's interesting. That's similar to something I've been through. I'd like to talk to them about that. And, and uh, we want you to get to know us and we want to get to know you. Lord willing, it's our plan to be in Hong Kong uh, for, for the rest of our lives. That, that really is our desire. We don't look at this as a two or three year experiment. We want to be here in, in Asia as long as God has for us. And I'm planning on that being until I'm uh, too old to get around and Tiffany has to push me in a wheelchair. So uh, we'll see uh, what God has for us. Let's look here, first of all, at Psalm chapter 37. I thought a couple of verses here in Psalm 37, and then we're going to look at Psalm 40, would be helpful for us as we start into this. Uh, if you see me turning this way, I'm glancing at my notes, okay? So uh, that, that's what's going on. Psalm 37, let's uh, start reading here. Um, in verse 1, and then we will um, look at a couple other verses as well. Psalm 37, verse 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall, sh shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. 
so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. We even see that here going along with the hymn that we're going to be uh, looking at this morning. Jesus, I am resting. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Then I'd like to draw your attention to another section starting in verse 23. Same chapter, Psalm 37, but starting in verse 23. The Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful, and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. This is a psalm of David uh, that we saw right at the beginning of this chapter, uh, and the and the the notes that are there, a Psalm of David, and here in verse twenty five, we learn that this is toward the end of David's life, where David says, "I have been young and now am old." Now I'm forty eight, so I don't know if that puts me in the old category, but I, I'm definitely not young anymore. Now some of you may disagree. Oh, you're you're very young, uh, but I, I'm definitely not in my twenties, not in my teen years. Uh, and, I, and David here, older in age, looks back and says, you know, all throughout my life, I have seen that God has been faithful. I have seen that God has taken care of me. Psalm chapter 40, Psalm 40, uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. And some of these verses will be familiar to you as well. Uh, the, the notes here in the psalm says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. So again, David speaking here. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies." Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. David here describes his plight and really being in a, in a difficult situation and being rescued from that miry pit and being set upon a rock and his goings being, his ways being established. And then in verse 5, as he looks back on all that God has done, he says the wonderful things that God has done in his life, if he tried to count them up, it would be impossible. There would be no way that he could describe all that God has done. And that really lays the foundation for what I would like to, to, to talk about and how God has led in my life. First in Psalm 34, that I was young and now I'm old, and I can say that God has been faithful. He has not forsaken me. And then here in Psalm 40, verse 5, that there are so many things that God has done. If I tried to count them up, they're more than can be numbered. Uh, he says in verse 5 that I will declare and speak of them. And that is what I'd like to do. I'd like to declare and speak of God's goodness in my life. I'd like to start by talking about my, my parents. My dad and my mom bo both are from the Midwest in the United States in a state called Indiana. And my parents both grew up in homes that were religious. Uh, they went to church. Uh, my mom grew up in a Methodist church. My dad in a church called the Church of the Brethren. And my dad's testimony is that he knew about the Bible. He knew about God, but he never knew what it meant to, in faith, and by faith and grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, trust Jesus Christ as his Savior. He thought, as many religions of the world do, that when he got to heaven, there would be a big scale in the skies, and God would weigh his good works 
with his bad works. And if his good works outweighed his bad works, then God would allow him into heaven. If his bad works outweighed his good works, then God would cast him into hell. And so my dad grew up trying to be a very, very good boy and a very good individual. He was faithful to their church. He tried to do all the things he, he should. But when he was 18 years old, he was preparing for his, uh, or he's after his freshman year of college, of university, and his brother, his older brother, asked him a very important question. His older brother asked him this. My dad's name is Carl. And so my uncle said, Carl, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Now that's a very important question. It's a question actually the Bible answers, and maybe you're here watching, and, and maybe you've not thought too much about that question. This is the idea of what will happen to you once, you, once your time on this earth is ended. Is there, is there anything that happens? Do we just go into the dirt and go back to dust? Well, the Bible tells us that there is an afterlife. The Bible tells us that we can know where we will go when we die. Well, this question was asked to my dad. What will happen to you when you die? Are you 100% sure you will go to heaven? And my dad, dad's answer was an answer that probably many people would give to that question. His answer was, well, I hope I will go to heaven. I sure hope so. My uncle then said to my dad, he said, well, Carl, the Bible tells you that you can know you are going to heaven. And I don't know if he took him to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, where the Bible says, these things are written that ye may know that you have eternal life. But what my uncle did say is he told my, my dad, he said, Carl, the Bible tells you you can know you're going to heaven. And I'd like to encourage you to read the book of Romans. Now, there are a lot of books that I can point someone to that wants to learn about Christ. The Gospel of John is a great one. Uh, where at the end of that gospel, it says, and many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. But these are written. In other words, these signs that, Je that John had recorded about Jesus, these were written that ye might believe on the name of the Son of God and that believing you might have eternal life. So John would be a great book for you to read if you're searching. But the book of Romans is where my uncle pointed my dad. And my dad started reading in the book of Romans. And I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. My dad was an 18-year-old university student who had grown up religious, knew the things of God. But Romans chapter 3 really jumped out to him. Because in Romans chapter 3, verse 28 well, let's see. It's not Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Let's see here. Uh, I lost my spot. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We see the Bible says, it would help me if I would actually be in the book of Romans. I'm in the book of Acts. No wonder I'm lost. I can blame that on jet lag, right? Romans chapter 3, it is verse 28. The Bible says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by what? What does the Bible say? The man, a man is justified by faith. And notice this next phrase. And this next phrase really stuck out to my dad. Without the deeds of the law. Interesting. So someone comes to Christ. Someone is justified in God's eyes, not by what he does, not by the deeds of the law, but by what? What does it say here? By faith. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says as well. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. My dad had never seen that verse before. And so that really, really, really impressed him. That all his life, he had been trying to get to God by doing good things. And the Bible clearly says that is not how we get to God. We don't get to God by being a good person. James tells us that if we offend in one point, we're guilty of the whole law. So it's impossible for our righteousness to be enough for God to allow us into heaven, for God to justify us. 
And so we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Can I just take a moment to stop here and say, maybe you are a regular attender at Island Baptist Church prior to the pandemic. But I mean, you feel that you're, you're a part of the church. Maybe you're a young person that attends Island Baptist Church. Maybe you've been a part of this church for a long time. But your trust in your salvation, your belief that you will go to heaven, has been based on maybe your family. Well, my parents are Christians. That, that's not what this verse says. Maybe your, your, your trust in Jesus Christ and getting to heaven has been just in doing good things and being a good person, being religious. And as my dad had to recognize, you need to recognize that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it is repentance of our sin and faith in Jesus Christ alone that brings us to salvation. And my dad there, as an 18-year-old young man, after reading through the book of Romans and really being challenged by this verse and many others, prayed and received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And can I just tell you this morning that if you do not know 100% that you are going to heaven, the Bible has answers. The Bible tells you to repent of your sin, to recognize that you're a sinner, to turn to Jesus Christ alone, Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn to Jesus Christ alone. Not adding Jesus Christ. Not saying, well, yeah, it seems like a good idea. Jesus seemed like a good person, so I'll just add that on top. No, no, no. It's rejecting all other ways and, and receiving Jesus Christ alone as the answer to your sin. So repenting of your sin, receiving Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and the Bible promises that you will be granted eternal life. John chapter 3 gives it about as clearly as it can, as it can be given, that God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him, the only begotten Son of God, that God sent into this world because he loved us, if we will believe on him, we will not perish, but we will have what? Everlasting life. And so if you're watching this morning, maybe as one who's been a part of Island Baptist for a long time, or maybe you're watching, not even in Hong Kong, maybe you're watching from somewhere else, and, and maybe right now you just need to pause this and get on your face before God and confess your sin. Recognize that he has died for your sin, that he rose again, that he is the only way for salvation, and that you'll trust him and place your complete faith in him for eternal life. My dad got saved uh, there uh, in, in the, the, the house of my uncle, and this changed his life, as salvation does. It is a conversion. The Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that every man that is in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this changed my dad's life forever. He started being more interested in the Bible. He wanted to know it. He wanted to learn it. And he wanted to live for God, not so that he could get to heaven, but because he had the Holy Spirit living in him and he wanted to glorify God. Well, that summer... My dad also had another major thing happen in his life, and that is he met my mom. My mom had been saved as a young girl, but really had not grown much in her salvation. And so when the two of them met, uh, they, they fell in love with each other, but they also started growing together in Christ. They were married, and after they were married, they started looking for a church to attend. My dad had grown up in a church of the brethren, and he, but he knew he did not hear the gospel there, and that's not the case for every Church of the Brethren church, but in his, he did not hear the gospel, so he didn't want to go to that kind of a church, and he started trying different churches simply to find a church that just preached the Bible. They finally landed in a church that taught the Bible, and it was a little Baptist church uh, in, in, uh, in Illinois. They had moved to Illinois at the time, and they started attending that church. A couple years later, I came along. A couple years later, my brothers came along. I have brothers that are twins, and they are 19 months younger than me. And my parents, as young believers in Christ, wanted to point us to Jesus Christ. They wanted to do it as best they can, as best they could, and they started teaching us the Bible. And as a four-year-old, I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. 
Now, I don't remember everything about that at four years old. That was a long time ago. Doesn't mean that I didn't get saved at four years old. But after four, there were several times in my life uh, up through my teenage years where I struggled wondering whether I had really been saved at age four. Looking back, I think I, I was saved at age four, and I'll share more about that in a little bit. But my parents really just wanted to follow the Bible to learn what God's word said and then just do it. One verse that was really special to my dad was Joshua chapter one, verse eight. I'd like you to turn there. Joshua chapter one, verse eight. As young Christians seeking to grow, this verse really had an impact on my dad. Joshua chapter one, verse eight, the Bible says this, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. And then look what it says, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. One of the things I'm doing right now in quarantine is reading through Pilgrim's Progress. And I've read it before, but it had been a while. And so I'm enjoying reading through that again. And just yesterday I was reading and there is a character in Pilgrim's Progress whose name is Talkative. And he, as his name says, he talks a lot about religious things. He talks a lot about all the things that he does. But the problem is he doesn't do them. He's a talker. He's not a doer. And here in Joshua 1.8, the Bible says what we ought to be doing is to know the Word of God, to observe what it is in the Word of what is in the Word of God, so that we will do it. And it tells us if we do that, we will have good success. And my dad just took God's God at His Word and said, I want to find out what the Bible says. I want to do it. And then the Bible promises that there will be success, spiritual success in my life. My dad at that time was working for a major corporation in Chicago, Procter & Gamble. He also worked for another major U.S. corporation, Martin & Marietta, as a salesman. He was making good money. He was teaching Sunday school in the church. And God started working in his heart that he really enjoyed teaching Sunday school and that maybe he ought to go back to school to do some more study to prepare to be a pastor. My dad was a math education uh, in his university study, studied math education in his university studies, and also studied coaching. But he went back to school, he went back to seminary to study to be a pastor. While he was going to seminary, he was the principal of a Christian school, and I and my brothers started attending that Christian school. I'm very thankful for that, that uh, all through my years in schooling, I was able to attend a Christian school that uh, not only taught me the academics, but also taught me about the Bible and about God. Uh, while he was there uh, uh, as a principal at that Christian school and going to seminary, the Lord worked in his heart further. We then moved to South Carolina, where my dad started uh, studying, to be, uh, get, uh, studying to get his doctorate in, in uh, education. And so he has a doctorate in education. Four years later, we then moved to the Midwest, to Missouri, where my dad started pastoring a church. And for 30 years, my dad, almost 30 years, my dad pastored a church, a Baptist church in Kansas City, Missouri, called Tri-City Baptist Church. So I grew up, for most of my upbringing, I grew up in a Christian school, in a Christian home, and then in a pastor's home. And I remember at a very early age, asking the Lord to help show me what he wanted for my life. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I want to show you something that I remember praying very early on as a, as a young man. And would encourage you as parents to encourage your own children to pray this. Acts chapter 9, we really have the story of, of Saul's conversion. And Saul meets the Lord on the road to Damascus. Most of you know this. And as he, as he meets the Lord, we see Paul's response to the Lord. Uh, let's start reading in verse 1 here of chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, 
that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So Saul has got permission to persecute Christians. He's now on his way to Damascus. This light from heaven, many of you know this story, light from heaven comes. Verse 4, he fell to the earth. He heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. And many of you know this. This is another place where we show that Jesus and God are equal, which is a key component when you talk to people about, about Jesus Christ in the New Testament. So the answer, he says, who art thou, Lord, Jehovah? And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, now watch this, here's what Paul said as soon as he realized who he was talking to. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I remember as a young, young man, my dad challenging me, Son, now that you are saved, now that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, Savior, your desire every single day ought to be simply to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And be willing to do it. I think a lot of times as young people, we want to know God's will. We want to follow God's will, but we just don't really know what it is specifically. And so as a young man, I remember in elementary school, in my earliest years, seven, eight, nine years old, I remember praying many, many nights, Lord, what do you want me to do? And my parents challenged me to have an attitude of just saying, Lord, I, I know I'm your child. And so now I just want to follow and obey whatever you have me to do with my life. Can I just encourage you that this is really what ought to be the heart of every one of us as a believer in Jesus Christ, as a follower of Jesus Christ. I've been reading through the Gospels this week, and you see this emphasized over and over and over in the ministry of Jesus Christ. That when someone wanted to follow Jesus, that meant they were willing to do whatever he had for them. And, and, their, and their service of him, and they're following him just to be willing to obey and do what God has for you. Brothers and sisters, if you know, if, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then it ought to be your desire to just follow him whatever he wants you to do. If you have children in your home, this ought to be one of the top priorities for us as we try to share the word of God with our young, our young people, that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and then they would realize what that requires then is we just obey God. We just do whatever he wants. It doesn't mean that every one of our children will be pastors or missionaries or in full-time Christian work. But it does mean that we want them to have the primary drive for their life to submit to whatever God has for their life. Whatever this book says, whatever God wants, I'm just willing to do. I can promise you I didn't do that perfectly as a young man. Uh, no question. If my parents were here, they could tell you multiple stories, and they would love to tell you multiple stories of how I failed miserably at this. But I can say before God, this really was my heart. I wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do. And I think this is a good challenge for each of us, that this would be our prayer, that we would do whatever he wants us to do. I grew up in that Christian school there in Kansas City, really from about 12 years old to 13, to 18, I was in that Christian secondary school. And while I was there in that Christian secondary school, I uh, met a young lady uh, whose name was Julie. She was a, couple, she was a year younger than me. She played basketball, and she was, of course, I thought she was very pretty, uh, and she also had a very sweet spirit. She loved the Lord, and I started developing a friendship with her, and I think you can guess where this is going. As we finished up secondary school, we then went to university together um, in South Carolina, a university that maybe some of you have heard of called Bob Jones University, a Christian university. I was studying Bible and music. And she was studying elementary education and music, and we continued our friendship. And then by the time we, uh, we graduated, we knew that we wanted to get married. And so right after graduation, the two of us got married, and we moved back to Kansas City, where I continued my education 
I uh, went to seminary for two years to study uh, the Bible. And during that time, Julie, my uh, new bride, she taught school. She taught uh, fourth grade uh, for, for two years there in Kansas City. Again, with the desire of, Lord, what do you want us to do? Uh, shortly after we were there in Kansas City, the Lord started directing us to serve at another ministry in North Carolina. So back on the east coast of the United States in North Carolina, in a beautiful place in the mountains, waterfalls. Actually, some of the mountains here remind me of some of the mountains in North Carolina, the waterfalls, some of those kinds of things. Uh, we moved back to North Carolina, Julie and I did, and started working at a place that I would end up serving at for the next over 20 years. We started serving at a place called the Wilds Christian Camp. The word wilds had the idea of wilderness or, or getting away. So the Wilds Christian Camp in North Carolina. And I started working there, and Julie started serving there as well. And for the next 20 years, uh, we served at the Wilds Christian Camp in a variety of capacities. Um, my, my job there was to preach to the young people, to help with the music with the young people, to help with the activities, and uh, to be involved in skits and uh, being funny for, for the young people, to help them enjoy a time of camp where they could come away with activities, with fun, but also hearing good music to point them to Christ and also hearing good, strong preaching. And during that time, God allowed me to uh, travel internationally. Uh, we had a ministry of the wilds called Camps Abroad that would allow us to go around the world. My first trip was to Papua New Guinea. Then uh, after that, I was privileged to be in the Philippines multiple times. Had the privilege of uh, going to Japan, to Brazil, to Romania, uh, to several places around the world to help teach them how they could use camp to reach the young people. And one of those trips in 2011, I went to Japan, and on the way back from Japan, we stopped in Hong Kong. And that was my first time ever to come to Hong Kong. And right away, one of the things I noticed in Hong Kong was that it was, a, it was an amazing city, just kind of a, a cool place. Uh, I loved the, the big city, but also the ocean and the, the mountains. Uh, I thought it was great that there were a lot of people that wanted to know English and that I could communicate with in English. And uh, I got to meet several people. And I think it was even on that first trip, uh, maybe my second trip, but I think that very first trip that I met this guy named Jonathan Johnson. And I knew him because of uh, uh, Jonathan and Catherine working as counselors at the Wilds Christian Camp. And, and I also knew his dad. And so that kind of was my initial uh, introduction to Hong Kong. I'm going to have to stop right here because it's almost been 40 minutes and we're not going to finish. But I just want to conclude by uh, kind of bringing things back to a couple things that we hit on uh, during our time. First of all, do you know that if you died, 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And if not... Why not? Because the Bible says you can know that. And I would love to urge you, if you do not know that, would you be willing to reach out to me, reach out to Pastor Johnson, reach out to somebody in the church that, that you trust, and talk with them? We would love to take the Word of God and point you to the Scriptures so that you could know that you have eternal life. It's the most important decision that you will ever make. It's not about how good we can be. It's about how good God is that he is holy, that he is sinless, and he sent his sinless son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And then second of all, ask yourself the question, if you do know Jesus Christ as your Savior, are you willing to do whatever he has for you? Are you willing to just obey him and just submit to him? And may we together be willing to serve God in whatever way he calls for us to do, in our everyday life, and then really even in the future. We just say, Lord, direct us in your will. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll conclude our time this morning, and I, I trust that uh, our hearts will be ready to be stirred from the preaching from Pastor Johnson this morning as well. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that we, have, we can give testimony that you are faithful to us, 
Lord, that you have been willing to work in our hearts to bring us to salvation. You've been willing to work in our hearts to lead us. I thank you for the way you have led in, in my life. Thank you for the way uh, you have led in, in the lives of those who are watching. And Lord, if there's someone watching, listening this morning that does not know you, would you give them the courage to reach for help so that we can point them uh, to the truths that are found in your word and they could be gloriously saved by your grace. Then, Lord, may you help us to obey you and do what you have asked us to do and just to be willing to follow you in whatever you call us to do. Lord, give us um, a sweet time as we listen now to the worship service. We thank you for Pastor Johnson and his faithful ministry of the word. Use it in our lives this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.